Hello, all. Uh, my name is Stephen Simon. I'm a senior research fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. And um, I've assembled uh, today a distinguished panel uh, to uh, explore issues related to affairs in Libya. Uh, the panelists uh, whose biographies uh, uh, appear on the website and on our website and in the flyer that was uh, distributed to, um, uh, to those who registered uh, are all themselves <clears throat> quite accomplished scholars uh, who specialize uh, in Libya and who've got a lot of experience to share on uh, Libya-related issues, at least the ones that we're going to raise today um, uh, in our discussion. Uh, uh, Mary Fitzgerald, as her tag indicates, is a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute, and she has focused a great deal on uh, Libya and worked for uh, uh, very prominent uh, think tanks, including the International Crisis Group. Emad Badi is a non-resident fellow uh, at the Atlantic Council, and he specializes in a range of security issues. Um, but in uh, regional terms, uh, he has worked a great deal uh, on Libya and been on the ground uh, investigating um, uh, uh, developments there. Uh, ben Fishman is, is also a scholar of Libya, but uh, he differs from our, um, uh, from our other two uh, panelists in that he has had uh, experience in the U.S. government uh, working on Libya policy uh, dating back uh, to the uh, revolt uh, in Libya in 2011, and we'll seek to tap some of his uh, historical insights. Now, I've got uh, two broad objectives uh, for this uh, session. Uh, one is to bring, bring us all up to date, really, on the situation in Libya. And the other uh, is to explore what uh, honest broker outside powers, particularly the United States, uh, can usefully do to improve the situation for Libyans um, uh, in general. Uh, as, uh, as we're all probably aware, um, Libya has experienced uh, some serious difficulties um, uh, before and after uh, the revolution uh, in, in 2011, and it now has uh, a divided government um, and, uh, and a very contested and violent political space. So um, uh, we we are interested in what the prospects are against that background uh, for stability in Libya uh, looking forward. This is not just a concern, of course, for U.S. Um, uh, policymakers uh, and, uh, and, and voters, but, but also for uh, European and regional uh, players uh, as well. Uh, what I'd like to do is... Uh, well, just uh, let, let me explain that, that I would like our panelists uh, uh, to speak for a total of about uh, 30 minutes so that we have a half an hour uh, for audience uh, Q&A. Okay, having said all that, um, I'd like to start with Ben uh, Fishman, who was in a sense present at the creation. Uh, he was uh, at the White House uh, when uh, the Arab Spring broke out and he uh, worked um, uh, he concentrated on events in Libya during that during that period. So, for Ben, um, you know, I'd like to ask uh, from his perspective, Ben, from your perspective, how did we get to this situation now? What happened in 2011, and what happened to the grand plans for Libya's reconstitution following Gaddafi's defeat? Uh, Barack Obama famously said that um, uh, you know the Libya intervention uh, in uh, in those years was a quote unquote shit show. Um, what? Why did he say that? Um, what went What went wrong? But also, what went right? If If anything. Thanks, Steve, um, and um, my friends and colleagues to, for joining us, Mary and Ahmad, uh, who can add more insight uh, than I can on the internal situation in um, Libya and uh, some European perspectives as well as the global, uh, um, current global crisis on uh, 
handling um, the situation in Libya. Um, since you asked, I'll go back briefly to 2011 um, and try to um, address two or three debates um, that still go on at this time to sort of set the context of um, the current situation. Um, one, um, was it a regime change operation from the beginning? Um, it may have been for Sarkozy, um, but I can say definitively for the Obama administration, it was not. Um, we hoped that uh, Gaddafi would, uh, or members of his regime, would negotiate a, um, uh, a dignified departure or some kind of departure um, with elements of um, the NCC, the transitional government, or uh, transitional representatives at the, of the opposition at the time, many of whom had served in uh, the regime as uh, more from minded individuals. Um, unfortunately, that didn't to transpire. Gaddafi rejected all kinds of uh, um, initiatives to uh, of outreach. Uh, he would famously wouldn't see even the Russians, even the EU, uh, even the UN um, representatives. Um, we changed approach basically in June. The revolution had started in February. Uh, NATO took over uh, operations in April. So there was good uh, two months of uh, and, um, still um, a diplomatic outreach for solutions. Um, it became clear. Uh, that Gaddafi wasn't interested. And then he, I, I argue and have argued uh, in writing um, that he himself changed it into a regime change operation. Uh, the second um, issue or debate is, uh, wasn't, is it the operation necessary? Or a variation of that is, um, was, uh, um, was it worth it for Libyans today? Um, was life better under Gaddafi than it is in the chaotic uh, experience today? Um, we viewed it at the time, and I still believe that um, it uh, was necessary uh, and um, to go to support the um, NATO operations and conceive of a, um, a policy, um, what was called by the UN and NATO, a regime. Um, uh, uh, population of protection mission. Um, and uh, that basically ended the um, Qaddafi uh, regime in uh, April, uh, September and uh, October of uh, 2011. Um, was it necessary because uh, he his threats to the population is so were so intense and so and he had a, a history of violence? Absolutely. That was part of our judgment. Um, and um, uh, including a threat to um, Benghazi and the whole population of uh, three quarters of a million people. Um, and then uh, the question about what if we hadn't done it? Well, it would um, most likely have been um, become a situation like Syria is today, where if we had done nothing, uh, the most prospects, uh, the best prospects would be for um, a long term insurgency and the level of violence that you see uh, in Syria today. Um, so, in my mind, uh, I still think it was necessary. I think it still think it was worth it. Um, and I judge, um, I mean, I don't live in Libya. I can't um, compare to the situation today and yesterday uh, or 2011. Um, but undoubtedly, the level of violence, the level of fear, the level of um, uh, has um, has in, improved on, uh, with uh, the, the level of uh, the dictatorship that has gone. Uh, obviously, Libya has experienced more multiple civil wars, violence, repression, um, fear of the increasing civil society crackdown, um, but life. There, I feel certain that um, it's better uh, today than it is better uh, was under this uh, 40 plus year dictatorship. Um, I want to shift a little bit um, 
to uh, what the U.S. role is um, and uh, where we are today a little bit and let my colleagues fill in um, more. Um, this is broad brush, brush strokes. Um, I used to have a slide keeping track of um, Libyan interim PMs. I stopped counting um, because at one point there were three that claimed uh, the, the prime ministership. And um, there have been um, several uh, and some recognized by the UN, some recognized by uh, an Eastern government that claims legitimacy. Um, but more importantly, from the UN side, there have been um, seven plus uh, UN special representatives heading the UN mission in, um, uh, in uh, uh, Libya. Um, and that doesn't include the interim Libyan uh, or the interim head of the um, uh, mission, who is probably the most effective and set up the process for um, elections in 2020, 21, that um, unfortunately didn't occur for many reasons, um, but she at least uh, brought the parties together in a serious way. So seven plus in 12 years is um, just indicates the level of um, international um, uh, division over um, Libya and lack of focus on, on the problems at hand. Um, and you can talk about specifically what those are. Um, for the US, uh, it's never been our top priority. Uh, even when uh, in 2011, but we were actually actively bombing Libya. Um, and then we turned it over to a support mission. Other issues uh, just in the Middle East were far more, not far more, but uh, had prominence. Iran was actively, uh, we were in actively negotiations and putting a sanction regime on it. Iraq, we still had thousands of troops. Um, Israel and Palestine always pop up as a crisis to uh, of the day. And of course it was happening in the context of the overall Arab Spring and Egypt and, and things like that. I've always argued that the US should pay more attention to Libya and be more active in the diplomacy, not necessarily to um, bridge the gap between the Libyan parties themselves, um, but for, to bridge the gap between the international actors currently Turkey and Egypt have a bigger role to play. Mary or others can uh, um, expand on that because I'm running out of time. Um, so uh, I'd always advocate for a more engaged role for the US, um, but it's uh, it always competes on um, with other bilateral issues on the agenda. Um, we rely on Egypt, for example, for uh, calming the situation in uh, with Hamas acting up. Uh, we uh, rely on Turkey now for uh, uh, a lot of the grain uh, Black Sea issues in, in Ukraine. Uh, not to say that uh, it sh we can do more than one thing at a time, um, but we, uh, as the United States, we should be able to do more than one, uh, more than one thing at a time. Um, and I want to make one observation finally on, on the Libya situation. And this is, gets to, back to the um, mistakes or hypothetical things that we could do better. Um, the, uh, we made the false assumption that because the, a lot of the Libyan uh, transitional authorities were Libyan Americans, they could fix Libya or they can operate in an in a effective context. That was totally wrong, and they they um, failed it. The, everything. Now we have the opposite situation, where the interim authorities are Libyan Libyans and know how to manipulate um, the money situation and know how to in, have inherited Qaddafi's bureaucracy, and uh, we can go on and and uh, basically we have a very corrupt situation where. Um, the oil wealth is distributed effectively 
to uh, do some things for the population, but most things for the elite. Um, so I'll stop there. Sorry to go on. Uh, no, you were uh, bang on the money there, uh, 10, 10 minutes. So, so, uh, so Ben, your bottom line then is that um, <clears throat> uh, Libya is better off uh, for the intervention that took place in, in 2011 uh, and that the international community is now effectively uh, engaged uh, and that the U.S. Uh, had made uh, really one big uh, mistake, as far as you can recall, and that was relying on expats, something that um, the United States uh, tends to do. It did so in Iraq and, uh, and, and elsewhere. So, OK. There were, there were others, but we can go on and discuss that later. You, you mean after the panel? Just kidding. <laughs> um, one of the technical sides that we should, and I'm going to set them on up for this, is uh, we didn't work as as, uh, um, as efficiently enough or effectively enough at the beginning on security um, sector reform. And, yeah. Uh, we took a pass on that, and the... Uh, um, the uh, efforts we made were um, in part political reasons and part other reasons um, were uh, ineffective. And it wasn't just a US problem, but the Western um, uh, interested parties. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Mary, I'd like to um, uh, uh, segue uh, to you. Um, you know, the United States, in in the in the period in the intra-war period, um, had a, a very elaborate planning process, as as you probably are aware, um, uh, and it was a multilateral planning process uh, that involved, oh, uh, probably a hundred people um, from uh, uh, various uh, regional states, multilateral organizations, and of course from uh, within the U.S government. And uh, this process yielded um, uh, a massive uh, post-war plan for the uh, recovery and stabilization of, of Libya in the, in the post-conflict phase. And, and as far as I could tell, it was never carried out. Um, so, I mean, Ben might have some observations on that for later on in the panel, but the um, uh, but for you uh, who followed uh, the the reconstitution of of the Libyan state uh, or the partial reconstitution of it uh, for a long time now, I'm, I was wondering what you thought of the international role. Why did it seem uh, to be so ineffective? Why? Why was the plan that had been worked on so assiduously uh, simply, um, you know, dropped uh, dropped from the radar? And how would you assess, in particular, the role of multilateral institutions, particularly the UN, which has taken on such a prominent role uh, in the in the formation or attempted um, uh, reformatting of of Libyan governance? Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Well, I would start first of all with uh, the history of the UN mission in Libya. It was established 12 years ago now, and the clue is in the name, UNSMIL, the UN Support Mission for Libya. So it's a support mission. That is a light footprint uh, mission. And I remember being on the ground in those early stages um, after Gaddafi had been overthrown, a lot of conversations with, with Libyans about the, the kind of nature level of international engagement that Libyans wanted at that point. And most Libyans were adamant at that point that they wanted a light footprint uh, UN mission. Uh, Libyans would insist that they could do this alone, they would need assistance for certain things, but what they were adamant about was that they did not need or want a peacekeeping mission. 
Um, now, at that point, the, the Libyan kind of ideas in terms of how they would address the fact that the country was then awash with weaponry as a result of, of the uprising, um, not so many solutions being put forward at that point. Now we're 12 years on, um, and there are some Libyans who, in hindsight, say that actually they were mistaken, that what was needed at that early stage was a more robust uh, UN mission with a more robust uh, mandate that would allow the UN at a very early stage to step into those conversations in terms of what would have happened to uh, the fact that the country was uh, awash with uh, with weapons. So it's interesting in terms of how Libyans look at, look at it differently now from this uh, particular vantage point. So UNSMIL, the UN mission has basically been really kind of um, limited in terms of what it can do. It's a, it can be a facilitator of political dialogues. It can advocate for uh, on human rights issues. It can uh, advocate on rec national reconciliation initiatives, et cetera. But it's, it's working within a very limited space. And Ben mentioned earlier the very high turnover we've, we've had of UN envoys to Libya. It's, it's been quite extraordinary. I think it's also fair to add that um, the UN mission has, over the last 12 years, been beset by scandals and, and resignations um, that have also uh, damaged the, the image of the UN uh, internally in, in Libya. And what we've seen in, in recent years is building frustrations amongst Libyans regarding the UN's role in Libya. Um, some Libyans will call for the UN mission to be dissolved entirely. Others uh, will call for its mandate to be revised, a more robust mandate, etc. But the UN, uh, the UN mission in Libya is also um, at the mercy of, of um, a divided Security Council. Um, you know, the fact that you have major disagreements at the Security Council regarding the way forward in Libya, you have had Security Council members supporting um, key spoilers in the Libyan uh, civil conflict. So that has really hampered uh, the UN's ability to actually um, do something on the ground. Also because the UN mission doesn't have the, the diplomatic, uh, political, and of course military heft to really pressure um, armed actors in Libya. And also um, very importantly, hold external actors um, accountable because the Libyan civil conflict has also been a conflict of, of external actors. Um, so we've seen, you know, Libya really reminds us of the weakness of the UN uh, san sanctions regime and the difficulties in, in enforcing that sanctions regime. Libya has been under a UN arms embargo since 2011, but since uh, the country tipped into civil conflict in 2014, we've seen very flagrant violations of the arms embargo by countries, uh, no most notably the, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Russia, Egypt, Turkey, uh, Jordan to a degree as well. And really there's been no censure for those, uh, those countries and those external um, actors that have been uh, stirring the pot. So also I would add that, um, because going back to your initial comments about how you know, Obama, the Obama administration treated the intervention first of all, but also the, the aftermath and the follow-up. And as Obama has made clear in several interviews, he and his administration expected that basically the Europeans would, would pick up the can um, after the ousting of Gaddafi, after the military intervention had, had ended, and that proved not to, to be the case. The Euro Europe has, um, has suffered from a disunity on the, on the Libya file. Um, uh, certainly since 2014, I would argue in many ways, even before that, from 2014 on, we saw a divergence uh, between France and Italy in particular, where um, France uh, supported Khalifa Haftar, the commander based in Eastern Libya, who was mounting military operations and, and nurturing his own political ambitions to be military ruler of Libya. France supported him politically, diplomatically, etc and uh, ultimately empowered him to become one of the key spoilers of, of the Libyan uh, process. Um, and Italy has tried to kind of play a more balanced uh, 
uh, game, if you like, though its detractors, its critics um, in Libya have accused it of leaning towards the kind of Tripoli-based factions over the years, and of course they've taken on different uh, colors. So really, um, the, the Libya file has suffered in the European context from that disunity. And while Paris and Rome have insisted more recently that they you know, have converged more on, on, on the Libya file, I think that it has left this kind of residual sense inside Libya amongst Libyans, that they're still kind of um, at odds with each other when it comes to the Libya file. So that hasn't, uh, that hasn't helped either. Can I ask you um, why the French are so attracted to Hiftar? What, what's in it for them? Well, um, the French, like uh, some of Haftar's other allies, uh, saw him uh, initially as a as a figure who, in eastern Libya, could deal with uh, an extremist presence that then existed in in eastern Libya. Indeed, French special forces were in Benghazi, um, uh, fighting alongside or working alongside Haftar's forces during that particular war. And also, uh, they Paris saw Haftar. They believed his narrative that he was um, building uh, a, an army. Um, uh, when you know, back in Libya, very much opinions very much divided over. You know, Haftar supporters will insist he has an army. His opponents and detractors will say what he has is a collection of armed groups or militias. Uh, claiming to to be an army, but Paris was very much kind of bought into into that narrative. And in in um, 2019, when the UN process, as it was at that point, uh, leading up to a national conference, which is supposed to kind of move the country towards reconciliation, ultimately um, elections, a week before that national conference was due to convene, uh, Haftar launched a, an offensive to trip to capture Tripoli from the then internationally recognized government. That lasted over a year. It drew Turkey into the war, intervening on the part of that uh, government in, in Tripoli, uh, in, intervening rather in support of the, the government in Tripoli. It brought Russia in, in a more muscular way than it had been before that, um, in support of, of Haftar. And the French, it has to be said, in the early stages of, of that war, very much appeared ambivalent on that. Um, I know that in Europe, um, those who felt it was necessary to um, have a strong unified position uh, against this war and to to basically make it clear to to Haftar that um, that people were very much opposed to this war, the French were were more ambivalent. Um, and I think that that was um, because the French, uh, basically wanted to see if, if Haftar ultimately could pull it off, which he could not. Um, uh, he uh, humiliatingly had to retreat from, from, uh, from Tripoli in, in 2020. Um, so that kind of gives a sense in terms of the different external actors, the different external meddlers that have made the Libyan uh, political uh, power struggles, if you like, that have powered the civil conflict that lasted from 2014 to 2020, all of those external actors have very much uh, complicated uh, not just the power struggles, the civil conflict, but all, also the ways of, of getting out of that. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, uh, for that. Um, uh, I'd like to turn uh, now to Imad. And uh, Imad, I was I was hoping you'd do a, a, a couple of things uh, in addition to wh whatever you'd like to to share with us um, uh, in your intervention. Uh, I, I was hoping uh, in the first place you would drill down a little deeper into the evolution of the security situation uh, in Libya uh, since uh, since the intervention and and offer your view as to why things evolved uh, in the way uh, that they did, and also to discuss um, uh, really building on what Mary uh, was, uh, was laying out there uh, in terms of uh, foreign power intervention uh, in Libya, a little bit more of those dynamics, uh, the Gulf, Turkey, Russia, uh, and so on, and how they've affected the military balance within uh, uh, within Libya, and and lastly, since you'll we'll be segueing from your intervention to Q and A, uh, just uh, in a sentence or two, um, uh, how do you view prospects uh, for stability uh, down the road uh, in Libya? Over to you, Imad. 
Uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, I'm not sure I'll be able to rise up to the task in 10 minutes, but I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, so to kind of paint paint a picture of of what happened since 2011 onwards in the in the security sector, I would kind of break it down in sort of four phases to to simplify it to non to non specialist audiences. If there are any Libya fields in the audience, we can tackle more in the in the Q and A. But okay. I think the first phase is one of a sort of period of entitlement, opportunism, and there's a sort of lack of closure in the immediate kind of post, post-revolutionary post era. So this is the 2011, 2012 era. There's a phase where uh, the armed groups are capitalizing on petty political jockeying, so domestic and international, in this case, competition, uh, and essentially cutting out the middleman, which in, in this case is the politician. There's a phase, particularly after the kind of uh, second civil war uh, of 2014, where uh, the armed groups are taking advantage of popular disillusionment and also taking advantage of sort of uh, the decline in legitimacy of political institutions, which which are by then are, are sort of bifurcated anyway and are penetrating the state. And the third and latest phase, which we've seen kind of particularly after the third civil war of 2019, is one of state capture, uh, where and and a lot and we're seeing a lot of a return to sort of Gaddafi era tactics, both in semantics of what the uh, what the groups now call themselves, but also in the ways they operate. Uh, but to go a little bit into more detail, what I mean by this period of entitlement, essentially, and and, and lack of closure, is that uh, the NATO intervention had this had might have had this sort of specific goal but uh the armed groups themselves that mobilized mobilized on a very much on a local basis and they were endowed with a sort of sense of entitlement entitlement after overthrowing Gaddafi Uh, and bear in mind Gaddafi only died at a later stage after the liberation of Tripoli and the recognition international recognition of the of the NTC so there was always this military ethos in the country that that persisted and lingered until after 2011. And for a lot of uh, individuals, the uh, revolution wasn't really done uh, until X goal was achieved. At first, it was taking over this area, then it was taking over Tripoli, then it was killing Gaddafi. And then after that, for some, it was about marginalizing opponents. And to this very day, you still see people claiming that the revolution is is unfinished. So this sort of military ethos lingers on. But back then, this was very much the defining kind of feature in the security sector, uh, in the security sector. And because of the offhand approach that uh, Europeans, Americans, etc., adopted, that meant that the Libyan sort of politicians had to sort of deal with this issue. And what they decided to do, unfortunately, and that, that the fateful decision was to deputize the, these armed groups to provide them security. So essentially, state fund them, bankroll them and give them legitimacy, recognize the rebels as official security institution. And this is part of the part of the reason why we are uh, where we are today. And this was sort of concomitant also with the rise of what I would call rogue militias, uh, particularly formed by young Libyans that didn't necessarily fight in the revolution, but saw in the aftermath an opportunity for enrichment, either by way of looting or then actually getting a salary, etc. So you have this massive ballooning security sector by by 2012, um, uh, which m- marks sort of the advent of, of security pluralism in the, in the country as such. Now, the next phase was more defined by political infighting, particularly within a then kind of burgeoning democratic transition with the General National Congress uh, in the country from 2013-14 and different blocs within it that had competing visions is what I would call them for how the country should be governed. Uh, This had ramifications on the security sector, both because of ideology, but also uh, opportunism, economic incentives, etc. Tribal, geographic, ethnic divides, all all of these affected things. But uh, the fact of the matter is, a lot of the armed groups began maneuvering to secure, essentially, their own sources of income either through the state or uh, outside of the state's control and the convertly in the in the sort of executive back then there were competing 
integration pro processes. So, and, and in many cases, this was often pitting sort of Gaddafi era structures or revolutionary structures against one another and allowing a lot of these sort of uh, divides to, to fester. And this culminated with the this kind of combination of political divides and uh, security tensions culminated in the second civil war of, of 2014, which is the first kind of, for many is recognized as the first civil war because it's not, it's not, it's widely not recognized as a, as a revolution. Uh, 2014, we can, tackle it maybe a little bit more uh, later, the, the, the dynamics therein, but I think it marked a little bit a new modus operandi for a lot of groups. So this is when Haftar, as, as Mary pointed out, started broadcasting the narrative of an army and returned to sort of, sort of a organized armed structure for a lot of uh, Western armed groups. This was sort of viewed as a, as a, as a threat, uh, returned to a Gaddafi era tactics, etc. But uh, the what this manifested as essentially is an institutional schism between Western structures and Eastern structures, uh, a schism to that to this day persists. But the the armed groups essentially leveraged the decline of the different political institutions' legitimacy and uh, their own de facto power on the ground to cut out the middleman in this case. So make their own their own fortunes, blackmail uh, blackmail the state or blackmail politicians, and in many cases actually penetrate the state. So you see here that uh, they are beginning to actually place their own, uh, in some cases, relatives or their own networks within state institutions. So capitalizing on, on that mid-level management layer of, of governance. And this played out a lot in municipalities as, as well, so local governance structures. The latest phase after 2019 is essentially the culmination of this trend of, of state penetration, which is state capture. Uh, and I think it partly is a reflection of everything the panelists mentioned on blunders in the UN processes, lack of focus on security sector reform efforts, really hands off position by the Americans, the Europeans, not a lot of interest in the file. And this allowed a lot of the armed groups to seize kind of matters in their own hands, because now you have a uh, consolidation of the groups that emerge victorious out of the different conflicts, the ones with better access to state funding, uh, better networks, or uh, in some cases, better access to foreign powers, whether it be Turkey, Russia, or other, or, or other stakeholders. And this state capture, I think, has a, a lot of implications for the future of the country because uh, we kind of tend to forget that from 2011 to 2023, you kind of have 12 years. And in a 12 year time span, the armed groups have not only grown more politically savvy and more uh, financially influential, but they also grown in, in size and in networks and in the number of recruits that they have. And Libya is a young country, uh, and a lot of young people are enrolled into these armed groups. So the the implications for the next kind of 10, 20 years are, are pretty significant if you look at it just from a demographic standpoint. Uh, but essentially what we have now is the rise of politically competitive militias in different, uh, geo in ge different geographies of Libya. In some cases, the consolidation processes are, are more advanced than in others. I'd say the most advanced is probably in Eastern Libya, where uh, Haftar has been at it for quite a period now and is now handing the sort of reins to, or I'll like trying at least handing the reins to, to one of his sons. Whereas in Western Libya and some theaters, this is still in more primitive, uh, primitive, yeah, primitive theaters where, for instance, the city of Zawiya uh, is, is in less advanced phases of this of this uh, consolidation process where you have a lot of different armed groups. And the capital Tripoli is a little bit in between all of these because back, if you, if you go five years back, there were pretty significant, a dozen almost armed groups in the capital. Now we only talk about four or five, uh, two of which are kind of the most influential ones. So clearly you're seeing a consolidation process and at some point, these these will probably culminate if we move to if we look at it from a political transition perspective, 
these are these armed groups are likely to become the main custodians of the political process uh, and given the way forward. So yeah, I'll I'll leave it at that, and maybe we can tackle more at the, in the Q and A. Uh, Emma, that that was uh, that was terrific, um, uh, and it's it spurred a lot of questions. I mean, in in my own mind, uh, about uh, the nature of hybrid armies and 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 the role in post conflict environments. I've been working, you know, on Iraq in this respect, um, and that there are some similarities that are interesting, um, uh, and would be great to follow up on. But let's segue to Q and A. Um, and let me pick up with Barbara uh, Slaben, who's asked a question that actually um, uh, uh, tags quite nicely to um, something that you just mentioned, Imad, uh, which is this. What role, if any, might Saif al-Islam uh, Qaddafi play in Libya's future? Uh, I, I invite comments from all the panelists um, on this on this question. I'm, I'm happy to take that uh, up. Well, what we do know, uh, because he registered as a candidate to run in the um, presidential elections that were planned for December 2021, uh, we know he would like, or at least at that point, he wanted to be a, a president. Um, so we, we know that much about his ambitions. Have those ambitions changed in the last uh, two years? remains to be seen. But I think actually what's what's useful is to widen the conversation beyond Saif al-Islam Gaddafi, who's a figure that outside Libya people tend to project a lot onto because he is the most uh, recognizable figure of the, the former regime for, for outsiders. And I think the, the question of what's happening with um, what some people refer to as the green uh, current, green being a way to refer to those who were either uh, part of the former regime, served in uh, senior positions, uh, su supporters, sympathizers, et cetera. And what we've um, seen happen with this current, though even describing it as a current is, is perhaps inaccurate because it is not in any way cohesive or united. It's quite kind of fractious, um, including factions that are pro Saif al-Islam and, and anti, even though they're all kind of supportive of the former regime. And that's how they are um, more and more part of the machinery of the state in Libya now, um, whether in, in Tripoli, um, including holding some uh, ministerial portfolios, but also in the security apparatus, both in Western Libya and also uh, under Haftar in, in Eastern Libya. What's also interesting about the, the Greens is that they are starting to organize politically uh, beyond this idea of Saif al-Islam wanting to be president. Um, there are some 70 political parties that have been registered um, in Libya in the last two years. Um, and of that 70, over a dozen could be uh, described as green or green tinged, which is fascinating given that, you know, these are people who belong to a regime that was um, opposed to uh, democratic politics, and they're now beginning to, to organize for future elections. So I think it's a really interesting question to think about what a Libya where the Greens are part of uh, more and more part of the machinery of the state, but also run for elections, parliamentary and presidential, what um, that Libya will look like. And of course, the ultimate question, and it was the case in late 2021, was if Saif al-Islam was to run in elections and those elections happened, how many people would, would vote for him? And that's a question that still very much remains open. That's that's fascinating. Would, would you regard the the process of of um, uh, I guess well you were describing what Ahmad was referring to as state penetration, state capture. Is 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 this um, a good thing in the long run or a bad thing for Libya? Is that question uh, directed to me or, or Imad? Yes, yes, Mary. Sorry, I, I should have said that. Well, you know, I, I, when you discuss this with with Libyans, there are those, of course, who personally benefit from uh, from this uh, the the system that has not just kind of been created, evolved, and now um, in many ways has calcified inside Libya. Those who benefit from that, of course would like that to, to continue. Those who do not and feel very much excluded from that, 
of course, um, want that to change and are increasingly frustrated because they see the window where that could be changed um, shutting um, ever, ever more by the day. And, you know, I, th I think another um, important note here is back in 2021, uh, those elections that were planned for December that year, what was really interesting in the run up to the, that election was the fact that over 2.5 million Libyans, um, about 80% of registered voters in a population, uh, a national population of about six and a half million, over two and a half million, not just uh, registered, but collected their voting cards in the weeks running up to those planned elections, which was really such a, a, a symbolic um, way of showing that Libyans basically want to change, are still wedded to a democratic process, if it means getting rid of the politicians they've been looking at for the last decade. And I think that that's something that really is important to, to remember in terms of that intention and the wishes of uh, that number of, of Libyans. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, we've got uh, a couple of questions uh, here that uh, I'd like to cover in our remaining 10 minutes or so. Uh, one of them uh, is, uh, I, I, I think for uh, Imad, um, and, and, and it just requires a really a short answer, I think, because the second question will require longer answers. <laughs> um, and, and that question is this, how does the recent loss of the founder and senior leadership of the Wagner Group change their posture in Libya? You want to take a shot at that, Ahmad? Yeah. Do you want to give me the second question or is it unrelated? So, oh, the, the second question is, is, is unrelated. It's sort of, um, uh, okay. a, it's a bigger question that's appearing in a, in a lot of posted questions. Okay, fair, fair enough. Um, I mean, on, on Wagner and their involvement in Libya, we need to bear in mind that uh, Wagner's sort of entrenchment in Libya and his presence in Libya is not, did not happen in a vacuum. It is not, does not exist in a vacuum, really. So it's influenced by, a, influenced by a myriad of factors, whether domestic Russian factors, in some cases Syrian-related factors, and then Libyan domestic, domestic factors. I think what the kind of loss of the Wagner leadership we want to call it diplomatically like that uh, is is the extent to which will it will affect things will depend uh, quite a lot on what the Russian state does because at this stage it's we need to look at Wagner PMC provided a strategic value for for Russia in terms of the definition of the group how it's dealt with how it learns the lies of uh, learns the line sorry of international law effectively and it's a good good modus operandi for for plausible deniability essentially and then we need to look at the other side of the coin which is the value added of the group for haftar specifically both within um conflict context where the where the group was quite influential in a combat setting but also now as a sort of holding force which tends to operate quite independently or with very loose coordination with certain individual commanders of of the Libyan Arab Armed Forces. Now, whether this modus operandi can survive the loss of leadership, I suspect yes, but this will require uh, a little bit of investment and uh, activity on the Russian, particularly Ministry of Defense side to replace said, uh, said kind of outfit, either as leadership or the outfits uh, as such. But the modus operandi as such at this stage, I think will remain uh the way it is maybe the names will change a lot of uh, the name of the outfit or the name of the commanders will change but i don't think a lot of the activities will significantly morph if they do it's slightly because of other contexts so not just russia or or or, or syria or even what turkey does but even looking at other sub-saharan african contexts where, where russia is now kind of using libya as a logistical node for those purposes. So this is the context in which I kind of see the Russian Ministry of Defense delegation visit the Maghazi recently. That's the, that's the lens through which I think it's. it's I think that's really uh, that's really helpful. Um, yeah. Just two uh, sentences on that. Um, yes. From the U.S. Yeah. perspective, Libyan uh, for the various U.S. interests in Libya, Wagner and getting rid of Wagner is cer certainly one of them. And we don't know what the situation will be. 
but somehow if um uh the defense ministry and russian defense ministry chooses not to emphasize libya um it's one less reason why the u.s should be invested there or will justify being invested there okay um uh fair enough uh we've got uh, uh 10 minutes uh more and i wanted to um uh I, I guess I wanted to return to a question that stemmed from the beginning of our conversation, but it appears to be a big theme in the uh, in the um, questions submitted uh, in the Q and A list. And that I, I suppose these questions are are mostly uh, for Ben, uh, but could be usefully um, uh, responded to by all three of our. Uh, panelists, and the gist of the question is uh, that, as as I read them, is what was this a good idea to begin with? Now, Ben made a spirited, um, you know, defense of of the NATO intervention uh, in in two thousand eleven, um, but you know, I think what uh what our audience is hearing from uh Mary and and Imad is that you know things are not going all that well uh and that there have been successive waves of civil conflict as Imad um you know had had framed uh uh developments uh the fragmentation uh of the state and now they might possibly be a process of consolidation underway uh, in in different forms. But in in the meantime, uh, you know, there's been a great deal of fragmentation of authority and um, uh, and and state resources as they've been um, uh, you know extracted by these many um, uh, militias and 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 parties and so forth. Um, so. You know, I think uh, our audience is looking at what they're, they're looking at something of a disjuncture uh, between um, uh, uh, your claim, Ben, that that, you know, this was a good idea because Libyans are, are now better off than they were, you know, under Gaddafi and 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 descriptions of political developments that seem to indicate that things are still quite difficult. So. Um, it, our audience, uh, a number of people here are asking, well, um, should we have done that? Um, uh, maybe it wasn't such a good idea. So I thought it would be a good way to, um, uh, to end the panel uh, with just um, uh, some uh, thoughts on the, on the part of all three of you, but beginning with, with Ben, uh, as to whether um, uh, the NATO intervention was, was 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 the right thing to do under the circumstances well we can debate this for an hour <laughs> or more um but i'll try to get to the point um there's a heavy debate not just in libya um but as you know and you've written a book about this um and phil gordon is judged the same as uh what's the proper um uh disposition of U.S. policy in the region. And people argue uh, that we should, because we haven't been successful, we should, you know, remove our ambitions or limit our ambitions, in particular to um, uh, what I don't term regime change in uh, Libya, but certainly regime change in Iraq and, and other places. That's one way of thinking. Um, and you can, uh, there's plenty of evidence to suggest that I firmly believe for various reasons that we can and should do better. Um, and that's another perspective. And I don't have a time to list all the um, areas that we could have improved over the last 12 years. Um, one of the comments from my uh, friend Bill in the in the chat is uh, referencing the murder of uh, our ambassador uh, Chris Stevens in um, uh, in uh, 2012, and that fundamentally 
uh, affected our ability to um, influence Libya. Our political will, the political firestorm that resulted from that, um, basically cut off all of our uh, ambitions to um, help the the government at that point. And then it it, um, it came and went for for various um, administrations and um, various uh, secretaries. Um, but I fundamentally think that with the right uh, pressure, and I mentioned it before, uh, international pressure, our uh, U.S. exerting pressure against the um, actors that are most involved in Libya for a negative way, we could do a lot of good. And I will leave it with one um, specific example. Libyan, Libya had two million plus uh, workers, um, in, Egyptian workers in um, uh, in uh, Benghazi in the east of Libya um, before the revolution. Uh, I think that's almost zero now. Um, Egypt has been uh, one of the prime blockers of um, uh, political or, uh, agreement to head to elections uh, for the last several years. Um, if they change their approach, the Egyptians change for their approach, they can return billions, uh, millions of workers getting billions of dollars back into their economy that is utterly failing. And that's just an approach that they don't understand because they view the status quo as uh, better than the unknown. And that's a bet uh, I would be willing to take, uh, but, uh, and I would emphasize if I were in government now to the, our, our Egyptian friends, but that's not for whatever reason, um, an approach that we're going. So, uh, obviously I, uh, disagree, uh, polite, uh, respectfully for the, for the approach that we should not be invested or we should not never have, um, uh, done anything. Um, I admit many mistakes, uh, but we don't have time to go through all of them. I did want to close with a, a plug for a book that Mary and uh, Ahmad have written brilliant cha chapters uh, with for that is, uh, I don't know if it's uh, out in uh, the US or, uh, but it's certainly out in Europe now, uh, Violence and Social Transformation in Libya, um, that uh, you can, e um, uh, since they're probably too humble to mention it themselves. Um, but uh, if you want to deep uh, dive into the the, um, the internal um, conflicts and that have, uh, we've discussed, uh, get that book. It's not cheap. Though. Well, thanks, Ben. And uh, congratulations, uh, Mary and Ahmad, uh, on that book. It sounds completely um, uh, uh, fascinating. And I'm looking forward to uh, to reading it myself. Um, in, in the remaining uh, 60 seconds we have, uh, would the two co-authors want to um, weigh in with a thumbs up or a thumbs down on the question of um, uh, intervention along the lines of uh, the NATO intervention in Libya? Mary? I was going to say over to Imad as the, as the Libyan on the panel. Imad? I'll say that consensus on this is not, I mean, yeah, there's no consensus on this even across Libyan audiences, but from, I'll give you the perspective of a scholar very quickly and that of a Libyan also very quickly. For, for a scholar standpoint, I think the NATO intervention was a, almost a state-of-the-art example for a multilateral intervention conducted with a specific military goal in mind, targeted strikes on strategic locales, minimal civilian casualties, although there are civilian casualties. Now, the other facet of the coin that you need to bear in mind is the aftermath and the failures. And those discredit the intervention in a lot of cases post facto, which is which is relatively easy to do in retrospect. There was a failure to plan, a failure to insulate Libya from foreign interventionism after the fact. And I think the kind of popular feeling in Libya is that it reveals a little bit of degree of Western I want to call it duplicity, disdain, or apathy for a very pop for the very population it once claims to kind of protect, because the R2P doctrine on the basis of which the intervention was engineered today is dead. And in a lot of cases, a lot of kind of the problems that we see are fed by 
U.S. allies, partners, etc. So uh, that's why I think the U.S. gets a lot of the blame for the intervention and for what a lot of, what a lot of happened thereafter. Uh, so yeah, that's why I think opinions differ. To give you a bit of a diplomatic answer and wrap this up. But uh, yeah, thank you again for being with us. Thanks, Ahmad. Uh, Mary, do you want to add something to that? It's very quickly, I, I spent uh, months on the ground in Libya during the 2011 uprising, and it's been really interesting over the years to continue conversations with Libyans I met during that year. And it is fair to say um, that many Libyans uh, look back to 2011 uh, who, who supported the uprising. They say they now regret it. Um, they look at the horrors uh, that have unfolded in Libya over the last 12 years. I think it's also important to note that, of course, Libya, um, Libya's chaos allowed it to become a hub for human smuggling with all the attendant horrors associated with, with that. That's something that uh, Libyans who are not personally benefiting from that uh, trade, if you like, they are appalled that their country has become a hub for this, as well as all the civil conflicts we've seen unfold. So I think going back to the point I made about the so-called Greens, I think that this question is tied up with the fate of the Greens politically and otherwise in the future. I think that's going to tell us a lot about how Libyans, the majority of Libyans, look back and reflect on the last 12 years and ultimately the question of whether 2011 was, was worth it or not. Thank you so much and, and uh, for that, Mary. And, and thanks to the panel. This was uh, extremely stimulating, very rich discussion. Uh, I'm sure that our uh, viewers benefited uh, greatly from it. And I look forward to our paths uh, crossing again. So thank you very much.